Hi everyone, my name is Robert Lilov, I'm a postdoc at the Technion in Israel. And before I start, I would like to thank the organizers not only for giving me the opportunity to uh, give this talk, but also for providing the circumstances that actually initiated this project I want to present today in the first place. That's because the idea for this project uh, was inspired by a talk given by Amanda Weltmann, as well as the subsequent discussions during the beta run of this very online conference. So thanks a lot for that. Now, to the talk. What I would like to uh, tell you about today is how you can use fast radio bursts to probe primordial long vicinity. Now, this is a project that has been uh, done in collaboration with Robert Reischke and Steffen Hagstotz and is published in this archive paper. So, let me start with a very brief introduction to fast radio bursts, or FRBs. Uh, those are very short radio transients, the order of a few milliseconds only and in the frequency range of a few hundred megahertz to a few gigahertz uh, that have been observed in the recent years. And while the mechanism of the emission is still debated, they have a very interesting feature that makes them a very promising cosmological probe. And this is illustrated in this artist's impression down here, namely the fact that the different frequencies of the FRB signal have different delays in arrival time. This is caused by the dispersion uh, due to the ionized medium that the uh, FRB signal is traveling through. That means that the dispersion measure, which can be ob observed for every single FRB, quantifies the line of sight integral of the electron density along the way, which is the contribution of the bearing ionic matter that otherwise is barely, impossible, barely possible to observe. Now, at the time, there are only a few more than 100 FRBs detected, However, given the um, characteristics of current as well as upcoming radio surveys, um, there's an expected number of the order of 10,000 or even a few 10,000 of FRBs to be uh, observed per decade, and that up to very large cosmologically relevant distances. Now, I would like to show you how you can use those to constrain primordial sanity. So what is that? As most of you probably know, uh, like a simplest model of inflation predict that the primordial uh, potential fluctuations right after inflation are Gaussian. However, many models of inflation actually predict a small but still uh, potentially observable degree of non-Gaussianity. Now, of course, if we are able to constrain the degree of that non-Gaussianity, that will allow us to distinguish between different primordial, uh, between different inflation models, and thus probe the very early phases of the universe. Um, the type of non gaussianity that we consider in this forecast is the, the local type, which means that the non-Gaussian uh, primordial potential field, phi and g, is just given by a local transformation of some underlying Gaussian field, phi g. And the way that is typically parameterized is by this nonlinear coupling coefficient, fml, in front of the quadratic term for Taylor expansion. Now, currently the best results uh, are obtained from the cosmologically relatively early phase of the universe, namely by measuring or constraining the degree of non-Gaussianity in the fluctuations of the cosmic microwave background. And the latest Planck results give for that a value of approximately one plus minus five. Now things become really interesting if you can push this uncertainty, this constraint down to the order of one. Um, however, with upcoming CMB experiments, there is no major improvement expected. That's why focus is shifting towards using not the early, but the late times of the universe uh, as a problem standing the large scale structure we observe today. The problem with that, or the difficulty with that, is that due to the nonlinearity that is already in the structure formation process, the collapse of structures, it becomes very difficult to, uh, to pick up, to pick out the small contribution just for primordial non -Gaussianities. at least if you look at, especially if you look at small scales. So one way to get around this is a certain effect that primordial non -Gaussianities have on bias traces on large scales. To understand this, you have to consider that if you have a non-Gaussian initial fluctuation, you have mode coupling. That means long modes of this primordial factor, uh, potential will couple to small scale fluctuation and density contrast. And they will modulate the amplitude of these small scale fluctuations which effectively has the, uh, leads to an extra contribution to the bias of any kind of trace that you use for density contrast. 
Now this non-Gaussian bias is both redshift and scale dependent. And to, uh, to estimate, and to quantify it, you can use so-called peak background split method. And if you do that, the result you find is the following. So first of all, this shift in the bias is proportional to the parameter f and l, which quantifies the um, degree of nonlinearity. Secondly, it's proportional to the linear bias of that tracer, minus one. So this extra effect of primordial inocentities is only seen in bias which are linearly, in tracers which are linearly biased to begin with. And lastly, if you consider that this potential transfer function down here, T5, is approximately constant for large scales, the large scale um, dependence shows this very characteristic one over k square dependence which is hard to reduce by any other uh, means. It also means that uh, the signal becomes stronger and stronger on larger and larger scales we're able to probe. So this is the way we also wanted to uh, use the dispersion measure of FRBs to constrain homonymous entities. And to understand that, let us first discuss the different sources that enter the dispersion measure. Basically, you can, uh, you can split into three contributions. First of all, there's a contribution of dispersion just within our own Milky Way. So this depends on the angle, just because that affects the, like, the amount of ionized gas that the signal is traveling through. However, there are models for this Milky Way contribution and for our forecast here we assume that these can just be subtracted so that we only, only have to deal with the other two contributions. The second is the contribution from the host galaxy. Now, the host galaxy, cannot, host galaxy contribution cannot be modeled on an individual basis because we neither know the orientation of that host galaxy nor the position of the FRB emission in that galaxy. However, for the statistic analysis that we are planning to do is perfectly sufficient to just to just to just model this contribution by a mean plus a Gaussian scatter around it. And we approximate both to be of the same order, namely 50 uh, parsec over cubic centimeters, which is roughly the same order that we find for the scatter of our own Milky Way. In addition, there is this one over Z bunch of dependence, which is there to account for um, the shift to the rest frame of the dispersing medium. Now, thirdly, and for us most importantly, is the contribution from anything between the host galaxy and the Milky Way. So this is the contribution from free electrons in the large, embedded in the large scale structure, which is for any relevant, for us relevant distances, the by far dominating contribution. So this we can also split in the mean contribution. It doesn't mean, apart from some constant prefactors, is given by a line of sight integral which depends both on the expansion function as well as the fraction f of uh, free electrons in this intergalactic medium between host and Milky Way. And the fluctuations around this mean are modulated by the electron density fluctuations, which we describe here as the density contrast of total matter and in bias of the electrons. Now, this bias of the electrons is the crucial bit that will allow us to, um, to see a signal of primordial non gauss entities if it is sufficiently different from one. Now to understand this, first I have to understand that the reason why electrons are biased in the first place is that astrophysical feedback within individual galaxies pushes the electrons out, out of halos, out of over densities, and distributes them more evenly, more homogeneously compared to the average matter. Uh, to, to estimate the strength of this effect, you can look at hydrodynamic, hydrodynamical simulations, and those suggest that on large scales, this effect is roughly scale independent and gives a bias for electrons of approximately 0.75 today, which then linearly increased towards one uh, at the redshift when feedback set in originally. It's approximately a redshift of five uh, in these simulations. And for any larger redshift, there was no feedback, so electrons are, were essentially uh, unbiased. However, this large redshift and this deviation already from one 
is perfectly sufficient to see a clear signal of primary non-gansinities in the correlation function of the dispersion measure. Now, one could look at the full 3D spectrum of the dispersion measure fluctuations. However, what we are looking at in this forecast is rather on our, the, only the angular correlations. So what we are doing is looking at the projected dispersion measure, which we get by integrating along, uh, along the line of sight, weighted with the distribution of the FRBs. Now, to get the, the redshift for the FRB, the problem is that they don't have any spectral features that would allow you to directly con, uh, infer a precise redshift from those. So, you know, basically two ways to infer the redshift. One is if you can identify the host galaxy. Currently, this has only been done for a handful of those, and it's not clear if in the future a large or rather small fraction of FRBs will have this host identification. So we might not be able to rely on that. However, it turns out that it's completely sufficient to estimate the uh, redshift from the dispersion measure itself that you measure. Basically, what you do for that is invert uh, the relation for the mean dispersion measure shown before and account for a scatter around the fluctuations both from the line of sight, um, electron distribution, as well as the scatter from the host. And in simulation that was shown, that this distribution was well approximated by a normal distribution. Now, one more problem. If we integrate over the whole line of sight, we're mixing all different scales of our signal, the longest and the shortest. However, we really want to be able to pick out the longer, uh, the larger scales because those are most sensitive to our modern longer sanity signal. So the way we can do this is by not doing a full projection of the field, but introducing a number of tomographic bits. So that the overall signal that we observe has a contribution then from uh, the large scale structure, then dispersion matter fluctuation spectrum in the bins IJ, and additional contribution from shot noise, which, is, which depends on the scatter in the host, as well as the um, uh, mean density of the FRBs. Now, a large advantage of FRBs over other, other probes is that this short mass contribution is for all relevant distances much smaller than the intrinsic scatter of our signal. So effectively, that means our FRB analysis is limited by cosmic variance rather than short noise for only a few thousand FRBs already, whereas you would need millions of galaxies to achieve the same in the galaxy clustering or um, shear analysis. In our forecast, we're considering two types of surveys, uh, survey characteristics, characterized by this redshift distribution, which is a reasonable approximation to any kind of flux-limited uh, galaxy survey. And the, the first type of survey we're considering is a very conservative, shallow one with a value of this alpha of 3.5 and only 5,000 FRBs. Uh, the other one, less conservative, but still very plausible, is a more deeper survey, alpha of two, and has uh, 50,000 FRBs. So down here, we see both these distributions compared to each other, and with vertical lines, we already mark uh, a tomographic binning, in this case, assuming four bins, and those bins are spaced in the way that they are. Each bin contains the same number of FRBs. Additionally, this white curve here shows the width of the scatter of the dispersion measure around its mean. So as you can see, this is still much smaller than the bin width, meaning that it's perfectly possible to just use the observed dispersion measure to uh, do a tomographic analysis. Now, to estimate the, the impact of the chosen number of bins, what we're looking at here is now on the y-axis, the signal-to-noise ratio of um, of the dispersion measure spectrum as a function of the multiple order L and color coded the number of bins we assume. We can clearly see that there is an uh, immense increase if you go from a single bin to multiple bins, just because we're able to separate the larger from the smaller scales. However, for a number of bins of four and above, this, uh, this uh, effect starts to saturate 
basically because the, the smaller the bins uh, become, the more correlated they are. So the additional gain in information becomes smaller and smaller. So for all our forecasts, we assume a number of four bins, which seems to be reasonable. Now, before I show you results, these are all the assumptions that go into the forecast analysis that we're doing. First of all, we assume that the uh, observed set of dispersion measure modes, L and M, and for different bins I, for a given value of F and L, uh, follows the Gaussian likelihood. Then we use a fixed fiducial lambda CDM cosmology without PNGs, uh, using the, param the cosmological parameters of the latest Planck results. Then the deviation from this fiducial model, so deviation from F and L equals zero, is constrained by a Fisher analysis. The prior we assume F and L is flat. We also account for our observed sky fraction of 0.1. So take into account that perhaps there will be some obstruction by the galactic disk. And we only consider multiples up to L of 100 because anything beyond this has uh, only negligible contributions from the primordial normal sanities just because the scales become too small. Now to the constraints we get. So what is shown here on the left, the shallow survey results, on the right, the deep survey results. The y-axis you see are constraints on F and L. The x-axis is the, um, the, the electron bias that is uh, the, at redshift zero. And the color coding shows the feedback or the redshift at which feedback in galaxies sets in. Of course, these are like the largest uncertainties of our modeling. And the black dots mark those values that are suggested by current hydro simulations. As you can see, for those assumptions, even the shallow survey gives you a, a constraint below 40, which is already better than current large scale structure constraints. And with deep survey, we're even reaching for F and L below 2. So significantly better uh, than anything possible right now. Now, of course, the constraints become weaker if we either increase the uh, electron bias today, make it uh, closer, to, uh, to, closer to one, or if we decrease the redshift at which um, feedback starts to set in. Now, the effect of increasing today's electron bias at least up to a value of 0.1 is rather moderate, it's rather robust with respect to that. However, the effect of the redshift average feedback set in is definitely stronger. That's basically because this does not only uh, lead to less biased electrons to begin with, but it also means that we get the, the, the scales that we are able to get signal from are smaller. So we are also seeing less of this large scale and more than our sanity bias effect. And lastly, we also looked at the dependence of these constraints on the number of FRBs, given the two um, survey depths, and for a number of FRBs spanning roughly 1,000 to 100,000, basically the plausible range. And what you can see here is that the current large scale structure, large -scale structure constraints are roughly of this order here, so basically already for a thousand FRBs, both types of uh, surveys would surpass these results, whereas the current CMB constraints are approximately here, and for the deep survey uh, will be surpassed by an order of 10 to the 4 FRBs. And anything beyond that, which is perfectly plausible within the upcoming uh, decade, will get us even closer to a constraint of the order of one. And with this, I would like to summarize. I hope I could convince you that you can, that there is a feature on large scales caused by primordial non gaussianities in the spectrum of the dispersion measure. And this is caused by the bias of the electrons that the dispersion measure is sensitive to, which is caused by electrons being pushed out of halos due to astrophysical feedback. Secondly, even without having to rely on host identification, a tomographic analysis is perfectly possible just based on uh, inverting the relation between observed distance, dispersion measure, and redshift. And thirdly, uh, the fact that our FRBs cover a very large volume, have a low shot noise, and small foreground contamination means that F and L of an order of one 
switchable with only a few of 10,000 of the Fermi's, compared to millions or 10 millions of galaxies needed for a comparable result using galaxy clustering or cosmic shear analysis. Lastly, the largest uncertainty on this uh, forecast is the feedback strength. So one of the things that can be done in the future is to avoid the estimate of the feedback strength uh, altogether and rather directly measure the electron bias by cross-correlating the dispersion measure signal with weak lensing, because this is a measure of uh, total matter fluctuations. But in any case, given the uh, results of our forecast, uh, we can conclude that FRBs are definitely a very promising and competitive tool to test inflationary models of the early universe and in the future. And as a nice uh, addition, they have very complementary systematics compared to other methods like galaxy clustering. All right. Thank you.